Anyway, we took our final five and showed our friend trailers for each film on YouTube. Does, does he know pick. what a trailer is? <laughs> yes. Oh my God, is that a laptop? <laughs> that's, that's a pretty big calculator you've got there. <laughs> I'm being really mean. I'm sure your friend is an Amish. I, 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 I know someone like he understands what a TV was. <laughs> yeah. I'm really sorry. It's just you know, the, the little bit of information you've given us has made this idea in our heads. It's just huge. <laughs> you just like you open your laptop and you just you scream. Just, <laughs> ah! <laughs> it's like the pulp, the pulp fiction, fiction briefcase. <laughs> oh, the Ark of the Covenant. His yeah. face just melts. Yeah. Shit, touch your eyes. <laughs> Sip should sound like. Mm. Do you get if you didn't hear that, that's the whole point. What about soup slurpers? You get annoyed at soup slurpers? Oh, yeah. You're allowed a slightly more audible bit of soup in inhalation. But... Soup can be, especially if it's a thicker soup, like a bisque. <laughs> You can, really, you can be wrestling with like some real viscosity. Bits of, yeah, you got like, like tomato or lobster floating around. But then I think that's more chewable. So you're less like. It's a different the problem. The thinner the soup, the more the. <laughs> the more it's likely to, like, you know, yeah, the water slide around the spoon. Yeah, the watery it is, the wetter it is, the more. <laughs> so if someone slurp you, you go, mm, I don't know, that's a, that's a vegetable consomme. <laughs> you shouldn't be. <laughs> I won't have what they're having. Yeah. Well, great. Speaking of food, I was in Paris. Oh, ah, lovely. All right. Their baseline for bad food is so much higher than our baseline for yeah, bad food. God. Their great food is, mm. I think, better than our great food. Well, I, I think London food is pretty amazing, yeah. uh, like most co like metropolitan sure. cities. But there's no bad meal. Even the worst meal I had, I'm like, that's yeah. that's pretty damn good. That's what I had when I went to Italy. Oh, oh yeah, it's, every, it's, every, Italy the same. I mean, obviously, but like, yeah, you, you know, every food is every meal is great, and then you come back to England and you're like, every single meal option. Uh, except for like fine dining, but like even mm. like your standard restaurants, yeah, it's always going to be a little bit like it's hard to describe, but you literally feel it in your gut. Yes, you literally <laughs> come away afterwards, and you're just like after a meal in Italy and France, and it's not just because you're on holiday, and it's no. not just because the booze. You just feel like oh, that meal nourished me. I yeah. feel great. But in the UK, you're yeah. just like. Excuse me, I have terrible gas. And, it, and I feel like I taste where I was. It's like local oh, food. Yeah. And like, <laughs> no, not at all. And I, you know, I got a bit, I actually was looking around Paris and wandering around. And yes, it was a weekend. And yes, I was on holiday and I was, you know, out spending money on food. But I was like, I don't, like in London, I've become very cynical where I just see like it's just Itsu, Wasabi, yeah. Leon, copied and pasted yeah, in like right. every single yeah. region. In Paris, it's like, it's just all, it's all bistros, but they're all yeah. individual bistros and they just have like everyone outside having a good time nothing's shutting at 11 and wanting you to get out yeah. everyone's out till one two in the morning you feel like in every pocket in the city <laughs> it's actually just very consistent and everyone's doing the same thing we couldn't sa we sound like we've never been outside but also we sound like we always go on holiday yeah so, I know. You know what I mean? it's, it's been a like, little like concentrated and they, and they don't even speak english which no, i believe it's it. amazing yeah, yeah they just ignore you they yeah just ignore you can they get water for the table it's like it's like i asked if i could stay the yeah. night at theirs. I, I, if i was lucky i got a slap in the face yeah and i kind of like it it's part of the experience they've ignored oh, me yeah. i'm like oh it's great yeah go did on, you experience going. that the parisian sort of yes yeah a couple of times just oh. like it, it, you know what they, they, they are gonna do the job <laughs> but it's like just so on their own terms yeah and that's okay Right. But Paris is lovely. It's got a nicer energy to it right now than London does. Oh, really do what does that so. mean? It's just like, it's alive. There's less there's sirens a, there's going a vibe. Like there's, 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 there's less crime. Like, there's just people out everywhere. And London is, I feel like there's a lot of dead pockets of air in London. Dead pockets of air. Whereas Paris, it's like all the buildings are the same same height. Yeah, but and all the energy is like evenly yeah, that's, distributed. Yeah, that's, but that's like historic. You can't you can't just no, suddenly change that now in London unless you just level everything. But we've had this that's like Paris has planned. The city. city was like yes. planned through. Whereas London is like it's so like old. Everything and, Eiffel Tower. Everything. Yeah, else, yeah. And that's whereas, it. Yeah, London's just like a bit of here, bit of this, yeah. bit of that. A gherkin. Why not? Like, why not? A shard. A sh <laughs> the, 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 it's the, I mean, it's the shard. But okay. the original. It's not called the gherkin. I can't remember what the actual address is of. It's oh, called, it's one. One Canada Tower? No, that's no, because that's can in, that's Canary in, Wharf. Yeah, I d I had a shoot in uh, Canary Wharf once. I didn't realize I was in Canary Wharf until I was looking out and couldn't see Canary Wharf, um, and I was uh, like, because you know how the tube is right underneath it, and yeah. you can almost go straight up underneath. Yeah. And I was like, I was like on the you know umpteenth floor, and I was like, I wonder where. Oh, I must be in there. How lovely, bum, bum, bum. like great. And while I was in Paris, 
I ended up, I didn't really watch much while I was out there, but I did watch one thing. And you know, I was just like walking around Paris with my girlfriend. You know, yeah. you just end up talking about these dumb things for way too long, like yeah. stupid hypotheticals. We were talking about, like, we sound like 10 year olds, we were talking about superpowers and yes. like the actual real life logistics of what it would be like to get a superpower. Sure. We went through the big ones like yeah. flight, teleportation, yeah. mind reading. Yeah. It's all of them. And yeah. we got really locked in on teleportation as the best superpower. And we were going over and over, like, well, if you did, how would it? And you couldn't show anyone and the yeah. practicalities. And I was like, Italia, you know, there is a movie about this called Jumper, starring, uh, directed by Doug Lyman, starring Hayden yeah. Christensen. And she was like, really? And I was like, this is not a good movie. No, really not. This is not a good movie. And it just ends. But after talking about it so long, we ended up what, at like 11 o'clock no. after dinner, we watched Jumper with Hayden Christensen. Uh, uh. But enjoying it for how bad it was well the writing's really bad it's no, no no it's a good the film's not good but i enjoyed the process of being like this is so bad right hayden christensen's character in it is like a real incel just really creepy right. isn't it christensen hayden christensen because it's not christian so it's that what like I said? scandinavian is that it's christensen oh that's what i said well, that's what i said but yeah i saw jumper at the cinema Oh, uh, did you? Wow. Because it's one of those times when you just go into town with yeah. nothing to do yeah. and you're with a group of people and you sort of end up at the cinema. And I'm, I literally remember that saying you decide, yeah. to, you decide to watch when you turn up at the, yeah. at the multiplex. And I, we, we literally did that. And I yeah. said, why don't we see Jump? It's got action. It'll be fine. And yeah. I thought I, I, was, I was expecting passable. And what I got was like under if the kind of thing you're in a restaurant you go this isn't finished send it back this it really is under, yeah, yeah. undercooked what and is I this? forgot Sam L. Jackson is in it yeah. and he's doing and the, Jamie Bell in, and Jamie Bell oh bad if one of Jamie Bell's worst performances mm -hmm. I really like Jamie Bell it's actually the writing that lets it down but I'm like Sam L. Jackson's in this and I would never have remembered that he's in this and he's just doing the intimidating Samuel Jackson yeah. thing. He's like, yeah, this is my brand of, to, to, to think his career most yep. cynically, it's like, this is my brand of intimidating. Yep. It's at its peak in like Pulp Fiction. Sure. But <laughs> like here yeah. it's just like, I can just glare at the camera and, and slow down my, my words. They even made a really, like a really crappy PS2 game out of it called like Jumper Griffin Story. I believe. Oh my god! Yeah, what, it's the, uh, the Jamie Bell like side. Oh man, I, I I've only wow. seen that once, but I really remember that being a re for a long time when I was younger and I was into mm. film by that point. I was like, that's, that's the worst such a byproduct of the area. The PS2 had so many like throwaway, uh, like you know, gotcha. just mark like you know, yeah, the cash off franchise border on the case. Do you remember that? Those were the platinum games, I well, think, no, that were like. No, really? Yeah. Oh, gosh. So those were those, all the successful the, the, ones. The successful ones we get like a new release as a platinum game. Oh, yeah. Geez. They used to have so much shovelware on PS2. And shovelware. Like, shovelware. It's like, uh, look after your kitten, the simulator. Oh, it's like God. just two pound crap yeah, games yeah, yeah. that's gonna that's sell. now clogging up a CX somewhere. Yes, or the landfill tragically, yeah. probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, if, you don't, if you see a turtle wearing it around its neck, then you've, um, yeah. Yeah. Dark. <laughs> and then like as the Christ. disc. Sorry. I'm getting the TikToks now. It's like, would you believe that this is the beach in Guatemala? And it's like a beach and it's just covered in like an ocean of plastic as far as you can see. It's very, it's very sad. And you're like, well, yes, I've never been to that beach before. They might've always looked like that. I, I'm going to deny, no, you just scroll past. Yeah, I just do whatever. I goes, wow. Flick, scroll, <laughs> and that's just so terrible. But that's- Wow. Isn't that <laughs> that's amazing? That's terrible. I'm going to talk about this on my podcast. <laughs> Jumper was awful. Uh, Jumper is awful. It's really bad. Right, should we go through some of the emails that we received? Let's do it. Yeah, I'd love it. If you want to email into the show, you can do by emailing hello at popkitchenpodcast.com and we will do our best to read out your email on the show. Hey guys, it's Trevor from LA. Oh, Back Trevor. for a sequel email. Oh yeah, cool. Hey. Trevor in LA. What's up? Um... Apologies for the length here, but I promise it's worth it. I have an amazing okay. film story I want to share, and I actually think the format of your show is well suited for it. You'll see is why. He on our production team now. Yeah. Great. Yeah, <laughs> Trevor from LA. I jest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll start by posing a thought experiment to you both. If someone approached you, for this we'll simply say it's a typical adult English man around your age, okay. and they told you they had never in their entire life seen a single movie and they wanted to watch one and asked you what they should watch what would you suggest? Literally, this person has absolutely no concept of movies. They don't know who Tom Hanks is. They don't understand any references. And you have to choose the first film they will ever see. 
now. Before you really dig in and think about it, this actually happened to no. me. Through a series of events a few years ago, I became friends with a man in his mid-30s who had spent his entire life in an isolated religious community. In this community, they had TVs, but the TVs only played local news and other information relative to their religious sect. So he literally had never seen a single movie. One day during a conversation, he mentioned to me that he had really wanted to watch a movie and he wanted to watch it with me and my girlfriend. You love movies. We all love movies. We love sharing movies with others. So you might think in a lot of ways, this is like every movie buff's dream. I cannot begin to tell you the pressure I felt. Oh How do you pick one movie to show someone who has no concept of movies or references or knowledge of any kind, knowing it will be the first movie they will ever see and ensure a positive experience? I'm sure you now see why the format of your show is great for this question. In the interest of fun, uh, and he's gonna go on, I'm sure you now see why the format of your show is great for this question. He has more stuff in his email, but George, off the top of oh your head, God. If you were in that situation and someone had no, never seen a film before, is there one film you would say, I guess you watch this? Okay. Um, that is a real, real question. I mean, if someone, I mean, wow. Like, because I was going to say, like, does this person have a concept of TikTok or Instagram? Like, how much? I guess not. This is like, it's basically. Yeah, fresh. Okay. My first thought was it must be like someone who grew up in like an isolated community, uh, which did. is what okay. that was, yeah. Oh, uh, I mean, this might sound like really basic and a bit obvious, but I, the, honestly, the first thing that came to my mind, I thought, well, you're going to have to show them the original Star Wars. This is exactly my thought. Huh. Because I thought there is so much in the original Star Wars that's about like like storytelling and, and, and has its roots in like, not, not just fairy tales, but like gather around the campfire. Like we're going to tell you a story of good mm. and evil. It's a, it's a fantasy, hero, like yeah. folk tale. Hero, very easy to understand. Also, you look at Star Wars, it's beloved by children and adults alike. And, and there people, are no like actual cultural reference points in our society exactly. beyond like us wanting to like our love our fathers. There's, yes, and, like there's no pop culture, something for yeah, ourselves. There's no pop culture references no. in Star Wars. So you can you watch get that. It. You could get Star Wars without having ever seen a film before. Yeah. Um, as long as this guy had a concept of space. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to blow up there? this mind. Yeah, Wait, but you like, mean <laughs> up there <laughs> where a guard is? <laughs> no, because like, haven't we all, like Luke does look at the, the bipolar sunset, yeah. looked up and ever wondered what else is and out there? Luke grows up in an isolated community, wondering what's outside, wishing to see and, and hear of stories of his own, and it's, he, it's the only one I thought of. I, I thought like you could. There's a. I think that the more we talk about it, the more I think that is the choice. Mm. Is there like an argument for just really throwing them with 2001: A Space Odyssey? No, and just no. giving them like a because a sensory, visual, artistic no, smack in the face. Because because there's something that's so um, uh, easy. Like you can anyone can anyone can watch Star Wars, and I mean mm. that nicely. Not anyone can watch 2001. I don't mean that as an insult to people's intelligence or a detriment to 2001. But 2001 is a bit more uh, esoteric, challenging. And I just yeah. I just feel like if you... I, I think they would have a reaction, seeing that as the first one they've ever seen. But they might come away thinking, God, they all like that. Then they're all like like quite long and have like extended sequences that aren't really related to other parts of the plot. And do they all have people in monkey costumes at the mm. beginning and oh and why was a monoliths not and, a weird thing to and, like turn up yeah and the senseless killing of astronauts by a, a sentient robot is that is that normal yeah, it's a so, reference point yeah whereas like even the concept of c-3po it's like yeah i, I can still conceive that he is yeah. a mechanical made of parts Put thing. would you show a kid 2001 no would you show them star wars yes would you show an adult star wars yes there you go there you go it's film star wars. it's really boring go. but probably star wars probably the original star wars so um did he, does he say what film he chose? Shallow Howl. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of anything, so I just pulled what was on the shelf. The 2003. You know that's kind of fine. <laughs> just <a> Shallow Howl. <laughs> okay, so we've now answered the question. I'll read the second part of his email. In the interest of fun, what I'm going to do now is put a big gap in this email so you can talk about it and what you would do. Under the gap, he I'll fill us. you in. Yeah, he never knows <laughs> us. He knows nothing. Uh, under the gap, I'll fill you in on what we ended up doing for this guy, what we chose, and his reaction. It was one of the most fun and rewarding experiences I've ever been a part of. He then put a big PDF of the London Underground thing with mind the gap to like separate the text. I love that. Okay, so here's mind how we approach. This is how I'm the reading. Gap. Yeah. 
So I'm still reading uh, Trevor from LA's email. Okay, so here's how we approach this question. I posted the story above on Facebook and asked all mine and my girlfriend's friends to comment on the post with their suggestions for the best first movie. Wow. We ended up with somewhere around 100 films. We had one. <laughs> in many cases, a film would be suggested in the comments and then other people would add their vote for that same film. So we went through and whittled down those 100 by which films had the most votes. We then went through a few rounds of voting with all of our Facebook friends participating, narrowing everything down to 25 films then 10 films, then finally five. You can imagine he's just sitting there like, I just want to watch Yeah, I just want to watch the movie. <laughs> yeah, God. The final five chosen were The Matrix, hmm. Jurassic Park, mm. The Shawshank Redemption, mm. Forrest Gump, right. and Liar Liar. I see the Forrest Gump bit one uh, yeah it's a bit on the nose isn't it it's a bit like how do we get this guy to catch up on 50, years of, 50 yeah. years of american history <laughs> yeah. from the po point of view of somebody who has no <laughs> idea what's happening that's why i immediately get it uh, and liar liar i also liar, get but there liar. there might be some reference points to me I'm, I'm surprised about liar because you have to know about the, the the whole joke of the idea about liar liar is obviously the concept of the lawyer being untrustworthy yes so I mean, it's the physical comedy you could laugh, like, yeah. you could laugh at, and the idea of him not being able to lie is universal. Yeah, but I just feel like there is there are more universal films than Liar Liar. Shawshank, I get. Yes, uh, people are incarcerated, people are isolated, want to break free. That's very universal. Mm. I still think that's quite specific. Maybe having no. What am I talking about? Shawshank is like one of the most universal films. Yeah. Right? So Shawshank is a good shout. I still think Star Wars is a better show. And then Jurassic Park and Matrix. Matrix, I think, it, although it's amazing, strong. I think it, it, Matrix is made for the everyday guy at the end of the millennium who was sitting in a cubicle yeah. and just felt like this is all dialed yeah. in. And it, it, was me, it was a reaction to people in this like technologically advanced, coded in lifestyle. Yeah. But Dr an, another, sorry. Sorry, not at all. No, I was going to say another film about someone breaking free. It's the, yeah. It's, it's that kind of, obviously that's classic hero's journey, but... Yeah. I, I personally think if, if someone had never seen a film before you turned in the Matrix, uh, it would like it would be way too strong. It would like it would just just so much the concept to, of like unplugging. Because like the you pills. and I, as casual film viewers, there are many more challenging films than the Matrix. You and I can watch yeah. the Matrix Matrix casually. Yes, I think putting the Matrix on for someone who's never concepts. seen a movie before, yes, it would blow their mind. But I would also be I'd worry about them afterwards. Yeah. Like, are they okay? They're gonna <laughs> keep wandering around. And go, <laughs> Hello, <laughs> this poor Amish man. I mean, like, like, <laughs> how's he going to know about the like computers and hacking and like the, yes. the whole idea of being plugged into an AI thing? software, and like coding? Make, that will make sense to us because we have a background culturally. We have a background of science fiction yes. to draw upon. Anyway. Even even like Jumbo on a screen, we can go. That's technologically advanced. Jumbo. You know, like the Jumbo. You know, when you see hacking in films. Yeah. Like the just nonsense numbers in right. Mumbo Jumbo, like that. Oh, I go, Mumbo Jumbo. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, you, you just call it Jumbo. I think you meant like the, the film with the, the elephant. Guys just call it Jumbo. <laughs> right. And then Jurassic Park. Um, I, I, does he know what dinosaurs are? I'm really sorry. For it, it, I don't want to patronize this man. What dinosaurs are in Jurassic Park? No. No, it's they just, just assume that you know who yeah. you know the dinosaurs are. Yeah. So you have to be a sort of. An, evolutionist i guess <laughs> God. also something i just noticed is they are all 90s movies interesting this is true i if i put that down to the fact that probably the age of the trevor the age of his friends and, sure and films they probably watched when they were younger or feel they could understand you know a bit of nostalgia yes yep fair um Anyway, we took our final five and showed our friend trailers for each film on YouTube. So, does he know pick. what a trailer is? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, is that a laptop? <laughs> That's a pretty big calculator you've got there. <laughs> I'm being rude. I'm sure your friend is an Amish. I, 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 I also like he understands what a TV was. <laughs> yeah. and I'm really sorry. It's just you know, the, the little bit of information you've given us has made this idea in our heads. It's just huge. <laughs> you just like you opened your laptop and he just you screamed. Just, ah! <laughs> right out the room. <laughs> It's like the pulp, the pulp fiction, the pulp fiction briefcase. Okay. Like, oh, the Ark of the Covenant. His <laughs> face just melts. Shit, shut your eyes. <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> Trevor. Finish, please. We uh, we took our final five, showed our friend the trailers for each one on YouTube, and let him pick. We also told him about the entire process, which delighted him to no end. <laughs> Good. So you didn't like say we're going to watch a film and then make him wait like two days. <laughs> yeah. um, he ended up choosing. Uh, I I know, but George, what's your prediction for what he ended up choosing? So it was Matrix, Jurassic Park, Shawshank Redemption, Forrest Gump, Liar Liar. I don't think Liar Liar. I don't think Jurassic Park. Uh, I'm going to say, I don't think Shawshank is like, because I think if you said to someone like Shawshank Redemption, they'd be like, what is that? But maybe, yeah, maybe I'd go either Matrix or Forrest Gump. So 
he ended up choosing Forrest Gump. His exact words were, I love the whimsy. And really, I think Forrest Gump oh might God, just be the perfect like... first movie. It has everything, and Tom Hanks might be the best first actor as well. Also, like, I love the whimsy. We completely underestimated this guy's film critic ability. It's <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Mm, I love the whimsy. <laughs> whimsy. And actually, the thematic relationship between some of the characters, there's like, oh, I thought you just like it because it's in colour and it yeah. has sound. <laughs> yeah. It's literally blowing your mind. <laughs> Uh, I hope you dig the story and I hope you find a way to share it on the show in a future episode. Even if you don't, I'd love to hear your thoughts anyway. Cheers, Trevor in LA. Thank you, Trevor. Well, that was a really Trevor, good email. I, there are very few emails that long that I will read on the show, but I enjoyed the journey. Yes. And I think it was, I've never thought about that question at all. Do you think this guy who they showed the film to is now like 20 stone, sat in his basement, <laughs> yeah. just keeps watching <laughs> films on loop. He's absolutely he's hooked to it. He's got a VR it. headset on yeah. and he's yeah. just like clicking uh, in yeah, the better yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, he'll be that friend now that goes, oh, did you see, there, have you seen The Matrix? Yeah, I've seen The Matrix. Oh, yeah, because yeah, it's a bit like, and like he'll just be talking to you about the history of cinema. And then he'll go, you know they made three more. He'll be like, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my God. And then you have to be like, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> or watching the first Star Wars and going like, yeah, like, I don't know what Darth Vader's beef is with Luke. Like, yeah. What's their relationship? That's a weird like, one, hey? Yeah. <laughs> Ah, oh, wonderful, <laughs> lovely. You know, I, um, when the when the first episode of Kenobi went on, they had this recap of the prequels, and it had this thing come up saying "skip recap," and I was about to be like, "I know," and then I stopped, and I enjoyed this fantastic recap of the prequels. Wow! And I was watching it, and I went, "Huh, am I to rewatch the prequels right now?" <laughs> yeah. And yeah. for some reason, they made this incredible cut, which showed the promise of what the prequels could have been. I would love it if they said, you know what, we are redoing yeah, we're the remaking, prequels yeah. and just going, like, look, all the best love to George Lucas. We're just going to actually scrap that and redo it because there are so or many- wreck on it. Just completely, just just completely go, we're remaking it like any other remake. I'd love them to just start again and be like, can we actually but do this But do you keep like the droids and the Gungans and all that stuff? You just not do it. Not necessarily. If they don't have, no, Gungans, probably not. You can't do that, like, James. completely new They've story. They've hardwired it too much into the latest. I know, it's the law. I know. I, it will never happen, but it's secretly, I was like, oh my God, that would be amazing. <laughs> Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, we had a brief conversation about double bills, didn't we? We, we, times, I think. Somebody, well, somebody wrote in talking about it, but you yes. mentioned a few times a couple of double bills that would be interesting. For example, Social Network and Steve Jobs. Yeah. And 99 Homes and The Big Short. Yes. And that got you and I thinking about what kind of double bills would work together, what strange double bills would work together. And so we've kind of had it ticking in the back of our brain for a few weeks now. And now we're going to finally talk about it. Mm. Let's actually do a double bill episode where, you know, let's exchange some ideas of what would be good double bills together. You know, maybe it's a fun reason. Maybe it's a serious thematic reason. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you've got friends over. Maybe you've... Have you ever done a double bill? Actually, have you ever sat and done a double bill? E in the cinema? Anywhere. Um, yes, I did uh, Inception Interstellar. Once. Whoa. That was fun. Whoa, we, where? Uh, IMAX. <gasps> it was... Uh, wow. Yeah, it was really good. And it was... It was like five and a half hours back to back. Wow. And it was... Um, in, uh, sorry, Inception first, then Interstellar. And Inception was not shot on IMAX, but the sound... <laughs> Was just like yeah. you know, like the in, the Inception Buang yeah, is yeah. now a meme, but like I was vibrating in the chat. Yeah. I thought I was taking off, and then uh, uh, seeing the moment where the world folds over like a like a pop up <gasps> yeah, book yeah. was was truly special. And then mm. in, Interstellar and IMAX is special for all the reasons we already know. Mm. But yeah, so uh, we just fancied it and did it. Wow. I yeah. Mean, I I have a friend who broke his arm in France, uh, mm -hmm. and then went to see Inception on morphine, and I always <laughs> wow. wonder what that would have been like. You know, trippy. Yeah, very trippy. Yeah. Anyway, I digress. Anyway. So you, you went to that. But no, not really. I've not really done many cinema double bills. I've watched, obviously, like films at home back to back, but I can't tell you, like, if they had any... Re I don't think they had a reason to them. Well, the Harry Potter films I've binged, but... Yeah. Here we go again, me bringing up every single week the before films, because actually, I did do... I know. That we you know, we should put a date in for those. We should, we should really do a big keen. special. Like, yeah. a big... But, but um, what I want to say is, the last time I watched those was... So there's obviously three films in that trilogy, but the first two, they did a double bill at Somerset House. You know, they do uh, the, the, the summer screening. So yeah, yeah. for our international listeners, uh, who might not know, Somerset House, venue in London, they have a big square in the middle. And in the summer, they have these film four screenings, but they have a massive outdoor screen and you go and you watch it outside, rain or shine. There's beanbags, there's proper chairs, whatever. You bring 
picnic, everything. It's really yeah. nice. And we'd never done it before. And I was like, I saw it. They, they don't always do double bills, but it was like before sunrise, before sunset. And I was like, Lovely. holy crap, this is made for me. A Wednesday, you know, a Friday night in August, what could go wrong? Well, I'll tell you, James, a <laughs> full scale shower. <laughs> and like, we were looking at the weather app. <laughs> uh, 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 the week coming, we're like, it's going to really kick in. It's going to really, <laughs> right. And all week we're like, do we actually go? Do we actually go? And we won't do it. Then we thought, you know what? We'll do it. We got rugs. We got rugs. So we got have like blankets. the bean bag, the bin bag hood. Yep, yeah, we got yeah. the anorex. I think we, we, we had, you know, wrapped the uh, blankets around our legs. We got a picnic. We got gins and tins. You got all the kind of <laughs> British snacky food you could get. And we huddled together and we had umbrellas. And you know what? It made <laughs> you me. Just imagine you, the thunder coming down. <laughs> Isn't this great? <laughs> <laughs> Can't even see the film. Um, yeah, it's like the perfect storm. Um, um, but honestly, it made it actually such a special experience yeah. because. It was just so so memorable. You're watching this film and it's starting to drizzle and you're really cozy. You're trying to like huddle up under I the... love rain. Rain is cozy. That's so British, isn't I it? I just do. It's, it's just, it's something, it's, it's the smell of it. And I tell you what, anyway, it was fine. <laughs> However, I, I, I won't lie, uh, in the second film, just before sunset, it really came down. <laughs> I'm talking like... <sighs> Like a little bit of sideways rain, a little, yeah. little bit of this and that. And Your people, umbrella people, pops open. Yeah, people were starting to leave. Luckily, not too much wind because some of that house is protected, right? Right, yeah. But like it was getting, and it was getting cold. And you, you know when it, it's rained so much, you know you're dry, but you feel damp. You know, you, you feel like the inside of a window with the condensation. Yes. Right? That's what it was like with Before Sunset. However, loved it. It was a great double bill. I digress massively. <laughs> um, let's talk about good double bill ideas that we have. Or just out there, outlandish, crazy stuff. Do you want to start? No, I think you should start. I think people have heard me talk enough. My first one I thought of, and the reason I wanted to choose these two is because I listened to a podcast recently and a... Wait, you listened to other, other podcasts? Pod there, are, there aren't others. There are. Yeah, this is the only this one. This is it. And it was a successful screenwriter talking on it. And he was talk he was giving advice to other young screenwriters who were trying to get their works made, Great. obviously. And he talked about this phenomenon where people who have yet to have something that they've written made into TV show film is that they only write for the screenplay and they never know how to take not just their ideas, but imagine it being filmed. Oh, nice. And there are certain films that if you were to read the screenplay, you would go, there's not actually much here, but when you watch the film, yes. the entire concept comes alive. Yeah. And the two films I put here are Mad Max Fury Road wow. yeah. and The Revenant. Right, okay. Because, sure. And so the reason I do both, because both of those concepts on paper, just completely whatever, Mad Max Fury Road, get from A to B with the people, they've run out, they're running out of oil sure. and it's complicated for reasons. No, they're, they're running out of water. Water, water. Oh, no, yeah. they're gas town. They're going to gas, to gas town. I've only seen it once, sorry. Anyway, and The Revenant is the story of gets bought yep. by a bear, comes back from the dead so yeah. to avenge his son. Um, but I remember, so I remember going to see Mad Max in the cinema. And my mom was like, oh, should we go to the cinema? I was like, what's out? I really couldn't care. And she was like, Mad Max Fury Road. And I was like, yeah, fine. Like, yeah. had not engaged with it at all. The trailer, for some reason, didn't appeal to me. Hadn't actually read any, yeah. read any reviews. And I remember getting halfway through that movie and being like, oh my God, this is like a masterpiece of visual storytelling. It's really, I've not mm. seen anything like it. Yeah. Like, what a, and the, the, to, to read the plot of Mad Max Fury Road in a screenplay, I would go, what's so special about mm. this? Even if you got big stars attached to it, even yeah. if we made it look really cool. But the presentation of that idea and how it goes on to like just take you on yeah, a ride yeah. is what makes that movie special. And I take the same concept of The Revenant. That's based on a really old, really, really old book, loosely based yeah. on the true story of what happened. But it's the presentation of that idea, which, which is what makes yeah. The Revenant special. And, you know, we talked last week about how someone was writing in saying they think the final fight between uh, oh, yeah, character yeah, yeah, and yeah. Leonardo's his character is so special because of the way which is filmed, the gritty nature of it. And I actually think yeah. if you were to watch these two back to back, you've got two films which are completely different yes. but in a lot of ways share a similar like the idea of what's written down here is not what makes it special. It's the presentation of cinema as an audiovisual format. And that's why I think they would be cool. Could you, could I contest that by saying yes. that? Could you say that about any film though? Can you say that about any film? Is is a, a, a no, screenplay is a skeleton that you then expand? No, because I could read. I could read you an Aaron Sorkin script, and I could like okay, me no, who's but not strong, okay, but, but me who's not like a uh, someone who puts scripts to TV. I go, yeah, yeah, I see this movie. It's scene A, B, C, D, E. Oh, okay, okay. Whereas like you, t it takes someone incredibly talented and artistic yes. to look at a script like that and go, that is my skeleton. I can build on something so much more, more using visual language. Yeah, I, I see I see your argument. No, there. I see what you're saying. Also, both your films came out in 2015. There's another link sure. to, to yeah, have there. Yeah, that helps. I remember that, uh, I can't remember who said this quote, 
but someone was quoting this when they were presenting a BAFTA for screenwriting. And the quote was something like, uh, a screenplay is not uh, a film, mm. it is the invitation to create a film. Yes. Right? It's not, it's not, so it's not the beginning of a film. It's not the film on page. It is the, merely the invitation to create a film. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what you're trying to say there. Like, yes. It's incomplete. And you, you yes, yeah, uh, it's the instructions with which to build a bigger thing. Okay, interesting. And also those are very visual films. I mean, Mad Max Fury Road. I mean, Mad Max Fury Road, I, I've only seen that once mm. and i remember seeing it cinema and i enjoyed it but i am very much aware now of its reputation and its status as being like high art like yeah. it is so revered as 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 you said a piece of visual storytelling do you find it over overrated no because I, I remember enjoying it i just think i, I you know I, I thought yeah that was good that was kind of wild and then as the years have gone by people have like there was not soon after that film came out there was a poll that put it as one of the best films that was released in the 20th 21st century wow okay and i was like i'm not that fury road and like like and like really prestigious cinephile circles were really lauding it and i was like yeah Mad Max fury road not that i miss something but like i i think i need to go back and watch it because i maybe i only took it in the way it was presented to me as and like you a, haven't a blockbuster cinema film and right. i haven't gone back and rewatched yeah. it. and then they released it in black and white and all that stuff so yeah i but i also don't want to watch it on a small screen. Mm. So I need to try and find an I've opportunity. I've seen it twice when once was outside in the cinema right. afterwards. And it held up? Yeah, yeah, well, it really does. I remember really the really sandstorm does. scene being particularly yeah. mad. All of it, like the 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 car, the, like the battalion of cars riding yeah. along and like just the visuals of it, it, it just, it's impossible to look away from. That has no reference point as well. No, it's there's, true. There's no, yes. there's no like, there's no thing going, oh, you know, this is a world uh, based on you know, it has it, its the, own the IP. I know, I know, it's based on you know the original yes. Mad Max, but like really, it has no connection to the original. Mad Max, it, like, right? it doesn't really have any rules that we know of. You're just yeah. thrown into this like complete dystopia, and you're expected to just like follow along. Because big, big dystopian could have gone for big world building stuff, and it kept on tight. Yeah. tight story it doesn't build its world it's like yeah. here is a here is like a dictator maniac yep. this is a remotely relatable human being character yeah. who doesn't really talk yep. yeah by all means try and follow along yeah. so yeah that was just one i, I thought based on a concept um and I, I think, yeah, it is. It, it is. It, I could just imagine receiving that script as like some researcher at a film, yeah. at a film production company, and being like, "What? Yeah. What's that?" And I, I wonder how many excellent scripts have just gone, yeah, disappeared because, because someone didn't get it. Almost read it too literally. They, they read it too literally. Okay. Uh, right. Have you got one? Yeah. I um. I was thinking. Uh, well, I, I was going to draw on a film we have talked about previously, right? Mm. So this, the first half of this double bill would be Good Time, the Safdie Brothers film. Yes. You know, we talked about that when we talked about underrated films because we talked about how everyone loves Uncut Gems, but you know, a lot of people still haven't gone back and rewatched Good Time, right? And uh, it got me thinking, but look, if you want to hear our thoughts on Good Time, you can go back to that episode and we, we'll discuss the episode. But mm. yes, Good Time, great, Robert Pattinson, fantastic. But the, the film I want to uh, pair it with is a film that a lot of people, when it came out, said, this is kind of reminiscent of... Mm, and that is a Martin Scorsese film from the 80s called After Hours. Mm. And it is Martin Scorsese's like only sort of toe dipping into comedy territory. Okay. okay. So just a bit of context here. So Good Time uh, is, as we explained before, Robert Pattinson with his brother, basically over the course of it's a day, maybe two days. It's like a very tight, except for the beginning with the, the robbery. It's like the, the whole main action is in one day in mm -hmm. good time robert pattinson trying to get his brother out um of of prison and um running into increasingly dire circumstances and having to adapt and change all the time and it's all set in new york and it's all very dark and it's all very frenetic after hours is this smart scorsese film from like 1985 um which begins with this yuppie uh played by griffin dunn who is sitting in a diner after work reading a book and he's strikes up a conversation uh, with Rosanna Arquette. Yes, Rosanna Arquette. And they get on very well and she gives him his number and uh, he goes back to his apartment and he thinks, actually, he gives her a call and she says, why don't you come over? And he looks at his watch and it's like, like quarter to 11 at this point. Mm. He's like, okay, I'll do it. He knows he's got work in the morning, but he's like, hey, okay, I'll do it. So he gets into a cab and the cab like speeds down the, the you know manhattan it's just w w and he's literally in the back of this cab like, bouncing around you kind of already get this sort of comedic tone bump again his money flies out the window it's gone so fast so he gets there like the cabbie's like shouting at him he's like, i haven't got any money so he's like stuck it there he goes to see this girl it's 
she lives in this very strange loft in, in New York with lots of plaster of Paris kind of models around and paper mache. And he goes down to the corridor. She lives in this very sort of weird, it's almost like a, a, a theater set flat. And they start to sort of have a day and talk, but it's actually quite awkward and actually quite uncomfortable. And eventually he leaves. Um, but for circumstances that would take too long to explain, his night is never ending. He can right. never get home. He always gets stuck. So when he leaves, he like forgets something or someone mistakes him for somebody else. He realizes he left something. So he goes to a bar. The barman says, okay, I'll borrow you some money, but I've got to do that. And, and, and he's constantly stuck in this increasingly maddening, frustrating. Yeah, safety yeah, But whereas the safety is more propulsive and energetic and really with a threat of violence, this is more like paranoid, um, uh, surreal, and slightly the borderline between dream logic and nightmare logic. So there's a wonderful shot where they walk across the street to this to this diner, and the, the shot is right down on the on the ground, and like the 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 steam from the manhole cover like licks up, and you've got the neon from the diner, and it's this kind of weird kind of painterly um, surrealism. But anyway. When this, when Good Time came out, a lot of people said, "Oh, that, that that's reminiscent of After Hours. This kind of like endless cycle of not being able to uh, uh, escape." And it was done. The, the, the connection was talked about so much that um, there was a poster for Good Time that came out that mimicked the poster for After Hours. And I'll try and put them up now in the video if you're watching. Which is so the poster for After Hours is a uh, stopwatch with the character's head twisted on top with oh, yeah. these two I red know, nails yeah. coming down, pinching it. And then they mimicked that with the poster of Good Time with him about to fall into the bottle of Sprite. And there's like a hand coming in, taking off the Sprite lid. It's just, very, you'll, you'll oh, see it when you I see the, side the poster of him in like the back of the police. Car. No, no, no. Oh. When, you, when you see this, the poster side by side, you're like, oh, I see what they did there. So I think it's a double bill. I'm not even sure which one you would show first. I don't know whether it's interesting to say, this was Good Time. Now go back and look at After Hours. Mm. Or, I mean, after After Hours, you might be just too frustrated to go into the good time. But I think the two together, it's kind of a nice dialogue between two dif different generations of filmmaking, two different aspects of New York filmmaking, um, two explorations of New York at nighttime. I think there's something in there. That, you know, I'm not the first person to put these two films together, as I was saying. You can read all about it online. But um, I was about to say Double Bill. No, it, the films aren't called Double Bill. But as a Double Bill, good time, After Hours, maybe. Nice. I reckon Good Time gets a lot. I, I reckon that film is really open to be put into lots of double bills. Yes. There's, some, there's something so it's obviously such a modern uh, and like, like as you said, it's it, it's it's its acceleration and its momentum is like one mm. of its key features. And I think that's something that applies to so many other films that it's borrowed from. And I mean that yeah. in a good way. I don't think it's in any. I don't know what I'm saying. No, no, no. But, I know, but, but like the the, ob the obvious double bill would be to put it with Uncut Gems, right? Well, yeah. But but I know. But, yeah. but we, we're trying to do something. Um, different with it. I don't know if you thought of any others that could go with Good Time off the top of your head. Off the top of my head? Ooh, no, nothing off the top of my head. That's fine. I, that's that's fine. That's fine. That is fine. Fine. But give me another one. Another one I thought of. It's a film I really enjoyed. It's a film called It Follows. Love it. And the obvious double bill comparison Follows. is John Carpenter's Halloween. Yes. Which it borrows heavily from... Uh, both in like its monster is mm. like really heavily inspired and its score it has this like slightly more modern mm. synthy version of the famous like do, 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 oh yeah do, 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 from john carpenter's halloween and um i really i really liked it follows and i think it's one of those films that really stuck with me when mm. i when i left the cinema i yeah, sorry i didn't see it in cinema when i when i watched it in a in a hotel and I remember I was properly creeped out for a really yeah. long time after I saw it, which hasn't happened to me with Hover for a long time, I think. I acknowledged, I was until like- Until you saw Men. I'm still, until I saw Men, yeah. <laughs> I, I acknowledged that that film's uh, horror concept really stuck with me and I was yeah. thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. And if you've seen It Follows, you know it's about this like old, like sort of medieval uh, like possession that happens, and it's a, it's a it's a it's a sort of demon that attaches it attaches to you through sex. Yeah. It's passed down through sexual partners, and it it's sort of like this boogeyman that's unrelenting and yeah. follows and never chases you. And um, I remember I watched it in my hotel like in an afternoon, and I was on holiday, and I got like really spooked by it, and I 
walked out and what it follows does so brilliantly is pretty much every single wide shot in the background there is someone walking yes towards the camera because this is in the film it says whatever whatever comes to it will be walking it will always just walk you yeah. could you can run for miles and miles and you might buy yourself time but it will always slowly it, walk towards you yeah. and throughout the whole film there's always someone walking towards the frame which gives yeah. you like a sense of paranoia yeah. i remember finishing it being really creeped out and i was in a hotel with a really long corridor mm. and i walked out my hotel room and yeah. right at the end there's someone just slowly walking towards me and i knew the concept just had me and um yeah you want you want to pair it up with john carpenter's halloween but i thought the film i would do a double will with is the village which is a film we've been talking right. about okay which i'm times. desperate to rewatch. And i think a lot of people are desperate to rewatch it and i think if you go on reviews for the village right now i haven't but i imagine you see some really bad ones a pretty bad rotten tomato score mm. and then you'll see loads of think pieces youtube videos yeah. and other things being like why the village is actually so much better than people gave it credit for and things that i think i've said on this podcast is that the weight of its twist yes. kind of at the time of its release yes. bore a bit of a heavy weight on mm. what the film was trying to do the reason i put them together is that the actual spectacle, oh, sorry, if you didn't know The Village, directed by M. Night Shyamalan, yeah. it's, are we, I think I have to spoil The Village no, now. No, no, you can talk about it without spoiling it. Because I, I think there'll be people out there who haven't seen it. The Village, do you think? Okay, I, I won't spoil so. The Village. The Village is set in this micro community, literally in a gap in the woods. And it just is like what looks like a very old, sort of late 19th century community, very sort of agriculturally focused. Yes. They, they sort of do barn work. Mm. And they have the- Not, in, un, not, not unsimilar to the community in like Midsummer. Yes. Very not, sort of bucolic agriculture. Yes, um, just very, very simple, stripped back, um, and they live in this dynamic where they are not allowed to venture into the woods because in the woods there are creatures in these red cloaks that will pursue them and you know it's applied they'll kill them if they leave and they wear red and red is this evil color that attracts them and whatever's red you have to bury so if the red flower grows in the ground they must yank it out and bury it because that's the color that attracts them and um there's all these complex dynamics between uh, Joaquin Phoenix, who's in it, and uh, Bryce Dallas Howard and Adrian Brody. And for some sort of uh, injury happens to one of the characters, and Joaquin Phoenix's character asks the village elders if he's allowed to venture outside the woods to go and get medicine. And that's all I'll kind of yeah. reveal. And um, what what this film does is that it has this sense of threat in these those we do not speak of Reddit figures. And It Follows has this sense of threat, which is... The, the monster that takes the form of many different mm. things to pursue you. But what I think these films share is that it doesn't make that much of a spectacle of its monster. It's more the idea of what that mm. represents, yes. which I think is so special. So finishing It Follows, I'm not thinking about what the monster looked like because in It Follows, the monster looked like 20 different things. Yes. And I think more about like this ancient evil based yes. around like sexual superstitions mm. and the judgments we make on like mm. promiscuity. And yeah. I go, I take that idea and I go, okay, so the village is also what it eventually reveals to you is so is so different to your original impression yeah. of that film. And what I think about what those monsters represent and the idea of like what it did to that community. It's very hard. I'm really trying not yeah, to. No, I'm no, really no, dancing no, around no, the spoilers. No, I'm village. glad you are though, just in case. Just in case. And I think that leaving the village, I don't think all oh, the, 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 the scary sequences, which are actually in the village, very played down. And they're almost, um, there's one particular sequence which is almost in slow motion, which is rare for a horror film to take its sequence in slow motion because mm. you almost want this idea that you need to get away quickly and we're mm. quickly cut and moving. And there's a, there's a scary sequence which is almost in slow motion, but you're on the edge of your seat being like, go, go, go. So I leave that and I don't think about like the amazing things the monster did. I think about like the implications of what made that scary. Right. And you bring up um you bring up men recently which is a f brand new horror film which i found really 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 scary it was a very good scare mm. and again it's it's monster to me was much more interesting than like it just being a horrible monster yeah. that scared me it was what it represented yeah, the which idea. makes you go yeah. that is what's clever and i, I th and uh, sorry another thing it follows is like this modern 80s synth scorching yeah. gritty like it doesn't really take it's, it's a very sort of like new uh, modern indie yeah. film and it, it the village it, it, it gives itself the appearance of being this old period slightly yeah. stuffy drama and i think it would be nice to sort of watch those together mm. and see what they're doing very similar despite presenting themselves very differently oh that's great i, I think that's a really interesting combination because obviously when you said the the halloween juxtaposition yes uh, it, yes it's a bit like me with good time and after hours yeah they're obvious there's an obvious lineage there i mean particularly in that scene and it follows when she's looking she's in class oh and she looks out the window great scene and it follows literally is the same scene in halloween where yes. she's in class she looks out the window and michael myers is there um and uh but yeah the village i mean i, I am really keen to rewatch that and 
I don't think it's perfect. I just no, think it, no, it but might I think be it, misunderstood. You know what I think it is, is that M. Night Shyamalan made the Sixth Sense big hit. Yes. Unbreakable, uh, not as big, but people liked it. Mm. Signs, people liked, for, yeah. for the most part. And then I think The Village was the time when the critical fraternity was like, probably when M. Night Shyamalan was trying to be a little bit more adventurous. Mm. And they were like, great, here's our opportunity to knock him down. Mm. Let's let's knock him down. This guy's had a couple of hits. You know, that's just the general narrative of like praise and criticism, isn't it? It's like you build them up, you knock him down. Because like, to up. be cynical, he's quite an indulgent filmmaker yes. in terms of... And he only like, got the worse ideas. from there. Yeah. The okay. Village is also kind of like the tipping point because really after The Village, he made like Lady in the Water and The Happening. <sighs> Lady in the Water. Oh, oh The Happening. The Happening I, is... I, I have seen The Happening, oh, but not for no. a really long oh, time. Oh, the trees. Lady oh. in the Water is where you're like, this is dumb. It gets towards the end of that film. <laughs> like the, the, the kind of names we're throwing around and the concepts, yeah. but God bless Paul Giamatti for landing the plane. He'll chew that through, yeah. <laughs> um, really, yeah, really interesting... Double bill there. Try to think just like unexpected ones that the more the, the more crazy the better. Yeah. Go see if you haven't seen it, follows. Um so good. See, a lot of my uh double bills are actually quite logical, and I could definitely mm. do another episode where I go really, really adventurous. But um I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you one that builds on another film we've also talked about recently, mm -hmm. right? But I, I I thought about this quickly because when we were talking about this film. I couldn't believe I didn't mention this other film. Mm -hmm. So the film we talked about recently is Top Gun, 86, right? Don't yeah. <laughs> not, not much we need what to talk- What makes you bring that up? <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's not much more we need to say about Top Gun. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you're listening, you've probably listened to other episodes about it. We know what Top Gun is. But we talked in that about the homoeroticism, right? That, that, mm. That's in it. And not critiquing it. We were, um, not Sorry, not criticizing it. We weren't saying that was uh, an issue. The, the thing we talk about with homoeroticism in- Top Gun is that it is there almost, um, it, it's interesting that it's there because it's there almost accidentally. It's not the intent of the film to put that there. I think it's also us viewing it through our present day lens. Yes, which exactly. Which implies a level of homoeroticism But to I it. think it's, but it's also, that's what's so surprising about Top Gun is that it's so overt, but yeah. but the film doesn't seem aware that that overtness is happening. You're like, how can the film not not be aware that this is clearly there? And Licking I said that- the lips I, like I, that. Yeah, and, and, the, and the steam and just the way yeah. it shot. And you know, I, I said the idea that I think Tony Scott perhaps did know, and perhaps he was, it leaning into it to really give the film a, a, an edge. So what I couldn't believe I didn't mention when I thought about all that, when we talked about Top Gun and that, is a French film from 1999 called Beau Travail. Okay. Which literally translates as either good work or beautiful work. Yes. And Beau Travail is about, uh, and apologies for my pig French interpreter, and apologies for my crap French accent there, but uh, Beau Travail, Beautravail is a film about uh, French legionnaires in contemporary France at the time in Djibouti, and the Djibouti, Djibouti which you've been, been to, you've been actually been to Djibouti. Actually, Djibouti. And you know, when you said it. you were going to Djibouti, I thought Beautravail. Oh wow, I must um, watch it then because I've so been. So it's about this group of legionnaires on in this like coastal uh, isolation in, in, in Djibouti. The main uh, character forgive me, I can't remember his name, and the actor, oh, I can't remember the actor's name, but he's the guy who's in Holy Motors. He's in loads of stuff. Great actor. He's got an incredible face. He commands these group of legionnaires, and, you know, he puts them through. The, 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 the film begins, and there's, like, these shirtless, ripped men running through an assault course, you know, jumping through hoops, jumping over stuff, climbing over things, you know, and he's in charge of that, and he takes great pride in being a legionnaire. And... His, he has a superior, you know, commander who's overseeing the whole thing, who he really looks up to. And the film is beautifully shot, so it's, it's a Claire Denis film, and the you've got these fantastic blues of the sky and the fantastic blues of the sea, and you've got this expansive like white desert around you, and these incredibly buff, athletic, thin, um, fit men, you know, doing all this work, but also doing a lot of um, domestic tasks, tasks as well, because they're in this sort of, you know male-centric community so that you see men ironing their shirts, um, laying the table for dinner, um, going out dancing. When they go out dancing, they wear their full like military regalia. And in this ordered community, and it's told from the perspective of, of this main character looking back, he, this main character now being in Paris, looking back at his time in, in, in the French Foreign Legion, in comes uh, a very striking, attractive, um, intoxicating uh, legionnaire, that the main character is completely thrown by. And it's all very, very subtly played and very um, subtextual. But it's very clear that the main character is uh, attracted to 
this uh, new recruit, but also threatened because it threatens the, the order that he's built up in the French Foreign Legion. And also he's threatened by the disruption that he will bring to, the, to what he holds dear. And he's almost pulling the desire away. It's almost like the main character's desire is, is being forced to focus on the new recruit and not on the French Foreign Legion as he loves it himself. Anyway, homoeroticism and male desire is like... A clear, is, is, is a dominant theme in Beau Travail, unapologetically, deliberately. Yeah. Whereas Top Gun, it's, 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 it's less, less um, deliberate, as we said. Yeah. So anyway, if you came back to the idea of a double bill, I thought, what an interesting comparison that you have a pop blockbuster American film from the 80s that is trying to be about just jets and fast and... Jets and fast. Jets and speed and women, but accidentally also becomes about like uh, male relationships and, yeah. and male desire romance and then another film about male relationships that is a european film made by uh, a woman that is very confident in making it and unapologetic mm. in making it about homoeroticism and male desire remind me of the year again that came uh, out 1999 so um i know there's a lot of people out there who listening either haven't seen it or never even heard of it but you have this it's not just that they, they have these shared theme, they also have this contrast between major blockbuster and art house film. Yeah. Art house European film, major American blockbuster. And I think having that difference, but also that similarity run through is a really interesting double bill. Also worth saying, uh, Beau Travai, 90 minutes long. Oh, yeah. So one of the reasons, I, whole one of the reasons I watched it, and, I, and I, I have it on Criterion, and the imagery in it is so striking, it's so beautiful. Um, and so lyrical and kind of poetic in how it imbues this uh, attraction in it. And it's very minimal, uh, very try. There's almost barely any dialogue. But, but with Top Gun, with the bombast of Top Gun, it's mm. all like, yeah, music! The sort of subtlety of Botrafai is such an interesting uh, compliment and contrast. So anyway. it's interesting, um, you know, picking up from another conversation we had last week, which was not one we felt like we could confidently answer about uh, films, especially in this modern day, addressing you know homosexual themes or even just like having yeah. a homosexual relationship, in watching it from our era now, where we live in a society where like one of the biggest things that defines culture right now is gender politics, yeah. identity, and that's amazing for mm. all the reasons it should be. But it also becomes there's like this weight to almost address that coming into a piece of art right. without letting it just exist in its own right. right. And you and I going back to review Top Gun, we can't ignore the fact that we look at a film yeah. like Top Gun or you look at you look at the other film, we go like, oh, like what a, what an obvious thing to us. Yeah. And now it's like, I'm wondering, is it now, are we like, bur are we burdened by this sense that we are only like, we cannot separate a theme from art in its sure. own right? And yeah. it becomes hard to go like, this just happens to have happened in a film versus yes. like, this is now because we are, this is a film that came out in 2022. And of course sure. it's acknowledging the politics of its time. Mm. It's like an interesting thing to now look back and go, well, obviously. Yeah, I see. I mean, also, I think it's worth saying that, like, in Top Gun, it is like the sub, 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 subtext that yes. you pull out. Whereas in Botrava, it's just the simple subtext, yes. right? There's also this great sequence in it where they're doing this um, training exercise and they have to do this, like, hug that's almost like an aggressive attack, but it, you, they, they grab each other's hand and then they. And you've got these groups of men just, like, slamming against each other in, like, this violent embrace. And it's mm. such an interesting image, a way of capturing, like, something that's an action that is usually so intimate, but almost like um, ag aggressifying it, making it really violent. Anyway, I could go on about it for ages, but Botavai, Top great. Gun, and here, I will not mention I Top like Gun that. now for a while. Super <laughs> unlikely. Yeah, <laughs> super unlikely yeah. anyone's going to do that. What kind of what crowd you, What gonna... are you watching tonight? I'm just going to double bill Top Gun and Botavai. If you like, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't seen Botavai, the Claire Denis film? Oh, man. Yeah. Like, How many times do they play K yeah. Loggins in Botavai? Yeah. Not many. Not many. I don't think there's... Oh, actually, no, sorry. Talking about the use of... This is very relevant. Yeah, go for it. Obviously, Top Gun is defined by its use of pop music. The ending of Beau Travai, I could have talked about this in our Great Endings episode, is uh, like crazy striking. If you're invested in this story, it's very still and very modest. And it, the end of Beau Travai just explodes into um, Rhythm of the Night by Corona. Mm. And it's uh, in, in this dance floor sequence that's completely relevant to the plot and just and the actor just his physicality is so specific to him and uh, it, you really have to see it to, 
to believe it and it's redundant for me to try and explain it. Yeah. But like you end Boat of Vine, you're just like, whoa, what the fuck was that? That was a yeah. crazy ending. Anyway. Oh, wow. I definitely want to see that. Can I throw you another one? Yes. Okay. I was going to talk about this film as just a film I saw recently and just give you a little review about it. But the more I thought about it, I was literally ironing a shirt and I thought, <laughs> and I was like, huh, you know, that film would also make a good double. Ah, oh. then I was like, oh. I'm going to be talking about double bills, <laughs> right? Okay. You like, so, you, you like stopped ironing and it started burning the shirt. Okay. So thought. let me just give this in. So the first film, the film that brought along this whole thought mm -hmm. is uh, a documentary that came out last year called The Sparks Brothers by oh. Edgar Wright. Okay? okay, So this is relevant because you and I talked about Edgar Wright recently in yes. his career and that was in a, a couple of months ago episode. And Edgar Wright had two films out last year, Last Night in Soho, but he also made this documentary about the band Sparks called The Sparks Brothers. And I think it was Edgar Wright's first documentary. And I think people were quite interested at the time because they were like, Edgar Wright's made a documentary. How does this very cinematic, very playful, um, you know, witty filmmaker do something that's set in the real world? You know, so how does he become a documentarian? How does he experiment with that form? So just a bit of context, Sparks is a band that um, commonly gets referred to as the best band you've never heard of, right? The yeah. greatest band you've never heard of. Right? Have you heard of them? I've, I've heard of them because of this you know, documentary. You've never, you didn't know any music before that? No. Okay, so I knew a couple of tracks. I discovered like a couple on Spotify like when I was like 16. And then I also uh, discovered one of their tracks because um, it was used at the end of Alan Partridge, Alpha Papa, which <laughs> I, I will stand by and say that is a, I think that's an underrated film. That film is very funny. Not I, mentioned enough. Not you know, mentioned enough. When it enough. came out, it had a poster where it was filled with five stars. Yeah. And then it came and went and no yep. one talked about it. And I feel like this, you know, the Alan Partridge train has moved on. Yes. But I will watch that film. That film's got so many good laughs in it. Yeah. Anyway, it's usually at the end of that. So I kind of knew Sparks and I saw this documentary come out and it's now on Netflix and I thought I'd give it a watch. So Sparks, this band from America, they've been going for 50 years. They've had 25 albums. They're highly revered. They're incredibly well respected. They've had some commercial success, but also not a lot of commercial success. And Edgar Wright says in it, how can they be, you know, revered, underrated, and overlooked all at the same time, right? Because mm -hmm. you couldn't call them an unsuccessful band because they've been going 50 years and they've had 25 albums, but you also couldn't call them like mainstream, whatever. And what this film, uh, sorry, Sparks is made by, these, is comprised of these two brothers, Ron and Russ Mail, and one of them is very striking with his moustache and, and they're very interesting and quite funny. Uh, funny looking, funny talking, Funny ha ha, all of it. Anyway, this documentary like talks to them and it goes through their 50 year career, etc. And I was thinking about it. And first of all, from an Edgar Wright point of view, it, he does get very playful with it. And it is very funny and he includes very sort of animations. And it's a bit with like, they tell this anecdote about John Lennon and he gets like a proper puppet in of John Lennon. That's cool. And at the beginning, the like, you know what it says, like a film directed by Edgar Wright, he gets Sparks to like sing that. So it's like, Edgar Wright opening anthem. <laughs> Uh, a film nice. by Edgar Wright, and then he he's introducing the film, and he does it through visual puns, and he says, "Here come a load of visual puns to explain what I mean. I want to draw back the curtain, Shh, unmask." Oh, <laughs> like, I see. So it's you're Edgar like, this fun, is yeah. Edgar Wright's film, right? I was watching Sparks. I was thinking about it, the Sparks documentary, and the thing is about them over 50 years. Like I said, they, they've had a case, they'll have they'll have a bit of success, and then they'll try and do something new. And everyone go, nah, okay, fine. And Jonathan Ross, actually, who's interviewed in it, says, Sparks are those band that comes along and you go, oh, they're back. They've got this great song. Oh, and they're gone again. And they'll come back. And, and obviously, over a 50-year period, there's like clips of like Terry Wogan being like, and Sparks, here's a band that was coming along when I was a young disc jockey, and now they're back again. Yeah. And you really get insight on what it is to, to, to be a band and be creative and basically live the artist's life your whole life. And it really got me thinking about that. <laughs> It really got me thinking about Get Back, the Beatles yes. documentary, right? Right. This would never work as a double bill because <laughs> Get Back is nine and a half hours long and Sparks documentary is, is itself like two and a half hours. Get Back is Friday's. almost like organized archive in its, yes. in its approach. And yes. I don't mean that in a bad way at all. It's, it's, it's the, the Get Backs, even though I've only seen part of the first episode, it's, its spectacle is the fact that it is just the raw, yes. it's, it's rawness. Yeah. yeah. And, and obviously, so feas feasibly what? In terms of feasibility, that would never work as a double bill. Just right. explain quickly what Get Back is. Oh, sorry, for the, the, I did talk about it in a previous episode. Yep. Get Back is the like nine and a half hour long um, footage of the Beatles coming together in late 1969 in a cold January to try and put on a, a live, uh, the first is to create a live album, then it's to do a live show. 
and it was seemingly lot like just recently found footage. recently found footage by peter jackson cobbled together um you know hours hundreds and hundreds of beautifully hours beautifully remastered film beautifully remastered you've got the four beatles in uh, it's post brian epstein's death so they're kind of rudderless paul's trying to hold it together john's kind of mentally checked out ringo's kind of gone into himself and george is desperate to kind of break free and be, and be his own person and why I think this would make a great double bill is you have a perfect contrast between these two documentaries about what it is to be an artist mm. and actually what it is to be a musician. Not only do you get insight into the creative process, in Get Back, you literally see Paul McCartney write a song in front of your very eyes. You see him come up with the song Get Back on camera. It's amazing. You see him rehearsing Let It Be and like cashing it out. That's fantastic. And with Sparks, you have them like working through decades and decades of trying to do new things and trying to experiment and, and still maintain and be true to themselves because there are a couple of times when sparks will have a hit and then and they're, they're, they said we saw the road we could go down and it was more songs like this and we didn't want to do that mm. but also you have this contrast between get back which is about the most famous band in the world in a very tight specific time frame which is three weeks in january 1969 keyhole window, keyhole window but also in a nine hour viewing period. Yeah. So it's an incredibly specific and detailed and minute look into this world of this incredibly famous band. Whereas the Sparks Brothers documentary is a two and a half hour journey, odyssey through this relatively, to most people, unknown band, this odyssey through this unknown band's creative process as well. And so formally you have this contrast, but together you get this idea of this is what it is to be a band, to be a musician, whether you're as high as the Beatles or as overlooked as Sparks, there is this thing about trying to get through to being true and creating the art and, and, and creating the music and what that actually means. And very different portraits, but both together, I think, thematically are quite interesting. Will anyone ever sit down and watch these two together? Probably only me. Yeah, um, you wake up at six a.m. and finish. But I think I night. think as companion pieces, they had to go together. So, mm. someone tell me if they go and do that. <laughs> it's just like oh, it's all, almost on a separate note. I was I was watching on Apple TV Plus the Billie Eilish documentary, which was the world's right. a little blurry, and not similar at all. But I was thinking about you know very famous musicians at the top of their game documenting the creation of their work and it's Billie Eilish and her brother Phineas coming up with her distinctive sound in her bedroom and their whole thing is that they shoot and record all the sounds together like right. in the bedroom with like curtains on the wall but it just made me think about how different the presentation of the rock star they're barely rock stars anymore mm. of what we have for like mainstream pop mm. there aren't really any rock stars anymore we have like our own brand of Billie Eilish Ed Sheeran Harry Styles mm. and their thing is all about like anxiety and mental health, mm. which is amazing. Yeah, of course, but it's yeah. amazing how different over time mm. are like new brand of like no one's like out partying, yeah. doing cocaine yeah. and stumbling out of a nightclub. That's not cool anymore. It's it's it's, isn't it amazing that that's yeah. not cool anymore? And it's like it's. And, I, I'm not saying that that's what the Beatles were, but like our representation of rock stars through the ages yeah. has just completely changed. And I think it's less that it like morphs over decades. I feel like we've had such a clear turning point yeah. and going forward, I feel like the state of music has changed. But that's also what's funny about Sparks is that they stayed themselves as they treated themselves for so long yes. that they were in fashion, out of fashion, then back in fashion again. They, yeah, they, they, went, pioneered, they, they pioneered electric dance duos in 1979 when they made this album with Giorgio Moroder, right? Then they went out of fashion and by the time and they came back in and they did uh, they had this hit in the mid 90s when they've been going for 25 years people said that sounds a lot like the pet shop boys and everyone was like no no they influenced the pet shop boys but they've gone th they've been there for some, you know lived long enough you see yourself become the villain <laughs> I and mean, that's like taylor's all this time of like not being able to capture the magic on the second album right yeah. like yeah, yeah from the last album anyways Great. that's a double double <laughs> So what's the game for me this week, James? Today's game is a slight twist on the game we have been playing, where we usually guess the film based on the cast. Right. Now, you have to guess the cast member based on their films. Oh, uh, okay, right, guess the actor based. Okay, I see what you did. You switched, did the switcheroo. 160 like vertical it. Got it. flip. You genius. And this is how it's going. It's going to work very similarly. I will read out films from the cast member that you have to guess i'll give you about from their three, filmography right yeah. from their filmography i'll give you about three seconds okay. 
similar to the game, the, the other game, I'll start with films that they're less known for or maybe more of a peripheral character. Right, and on. towards the end, it will be more of their title roles, the films that they're known for. Okay? This is the first film. Okay. This is the first one. Okay. You have to guess the actor based on their filmography. Okay. In three, two, one. The Martian. Uh, Sebastian Stan. He's in that. People don't remember. Is he? Yeah. It's not him. No. Lawless. <laughs> it Chapter Two. Uh, big cast. I see what you're doing here. Mm. You're doing films with mm. lots um, of people in that. Mama. Jessica Chastain. Jessica Chastain. That's very good. So next one would have been Interstellar. Yes. A Most Violent Year. Yes, great. Zero Dark Thirty. I think you would definitely yeah, got yeah, by yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Molly's. Game. I'm annoyed I didn't get that quicker. Actually, that's yeah. There you go. Number two. You have to guess the cast member based on their filmography. Annihilation. Okay. Drive. Okay, I was going to say Tessa Thompson, so no. Uh, drive. Dune. Oh, oh. Um, uh, the yeah, Two yeah, Faces yeah, of yeah, January. Yeah, Oscar Isaac, thank Oscar you. Oscar Isaac, very good. After that, you would have got Star Wars The Force Awakens. Yes. Ex Machina. Yes. And then Inside Lewin Davis, yes. which came up on our show this recently. This goes really easy. <laughs> I think this one is a bit harder. Okay, bring but it. I, I don't know, we'll see how you do. You have to guess the cast. No. You have to guess the film. No. Guess the you actor. Have <laughs> you have to guess the actor based on their filmography in okay. three, two, one. Vice. I assume it's not Christian Bale. The Post. Ooh. Um, crikey. Uh, Game Night. Uh, uh, the Irishman. Oh, oh. Um, it's uh, your guy. Your, 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 your Jesse Plemons. Jesse Plemons. <laughs> Because he is in Vice. But he he's is. The, he's he's the, extra, the guy who narrates. Yes. It's actually a pretty big film for me to put as the first one because yes. he narrates from the beginning. Uh, so yeah, it was the po uh, Vice, the Post, Game Night Irishman, Black Mass. He actually has a similar Black role. Mass. I know, it's a bit of a... He has a similar role in uh, Black Mass he does in Vice, doesn't he? He sort well, of does okay. a bit of narration. Uh, Jungle Cruise. I never didn't see it. He's in it. Uh, the Power of the Dog, which is a recent one you probably could have got. Windfall, which I haven't seen, which is on Netflix. And then El Camino, which I think would He's have... great in that. He's so, so good, good in El good Camino. In that, I think yeah. that's one of his best roles. To yeah. And not to like just be like basic bitch, you know, Breaking Bad, but he is genuinely yeah. quite unnerving in that. Mm. Okay. Next film. About a boy. Uh, uh, Nicholas Holt, obviously. I mean, I guess... Definitely, maybe. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Ida Fisher, Rachel. Yeah, oh, Rachel, Rachel, Weiss. Weiss. yeah. Rachel, Rachel Weiss. Weiss. Sorry, because she comes in at the end. She comes. She, she, she's Rachel like one Weiss. of the last people in it. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely. Maybe that's a film I haven't thought about. That's a, that's a Who's yeah. the third woman in that? It's Ida it's Fisher, uh, Rachel Weiss. What's her name? She's in uh, like the forty-year-old virgin and shit. I feel really bad Not forgetting her Lazy name. Man. No, Catherine Keener. Elizabeth. No, no. it's Elizabeth. We're, this is the game now. <laughs> We genuinely don't know the answer. She is in Elizabeth Banks. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Banks. Banks. I just typed Elizabeth into Google and I just got Queen Elizabeth. The Obviously, same. the most famous Elizabeth. Uh, yes, yeah, so that was very good. You got it was Rachel Vice. So it was going to be Black Widow, Disobedience, The Lobster, The Mummy. Right. When you said uh, about boy, I was going to say Tony Collette as well. People forget yes. Tony Collette's in about she boy. She is. Oh. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Okay. Okay. I keep saying this might be harder, but it might not. Right. <laughs> this first one. Okay. Guess. The actor based on their filmography. Sure. Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides. Oh, <laughs> uh, Jeffrey Rush. Um, the Hunger uh, Games. Uh, Woody Harrelson. Um, Stanley Tucci. The Riot Club. Uh, but no, well, I was going to say Journey's Tom, End. Not Tom Holland. 2017. Tom Hollander? No. Because Tom Hollander is, but he's not in that part. No, but that's a good guess. Journey's, they, oh yeah, they did make a film about Journey's End. 2017. Yeah. God. Uh, Their Ace of Butterworth. No. Their uh, oh, oh, Sam Claflin. Yes. Doesn't he Sam play a Claflin. mermaid in uh, Stranger Tides? I've not seen on the fourth of the Caribbean movie. But I thought I'd put that as the first one because there are actually lots of actors in, there are actually lots of big actors in the Pirates movies. Yeah, like yeah. There's, there's Bill Nye, Jeffrey yeah. Wright. Anyway, 
Uh, yes, after that, it was their finest. Enola Holmes, which I didn't see on Netflix. Love Rosie. Right, and then yes. My Cousin yeah, yeah, Rachel, yeah, which I think would... I didn't see Love Rosie. Did you I, see Love no, Rosie? But no, but I, I do like Sam Carter. I do Me rate too. him as an actor. Me too. I think he's good in um, lots of that. He's great in My Cousin Rachel. He's great in The Riot Club. Yeah. Um, right. Next one. You have okay. to guess the actor based off their filmography. Venom, Let There Be Carnage. Great. Great. Um, I haven't seen it, so I don't know. Um, Woody Harrelson. Rampage. Which is that's the, the big rock the film. Yeah. The, the, um, <laughs> I'm the uh, collateral beauty. I've not seen that's meant to be that's a real stinker, apparently. Yeah. That's a real, it's one of the Will Smith weird, um, seven pounds, uh, yeah. like era. Yeah, I, I haven't seen any of these Pirates so... of the Caribbean at World's oh, End. God. <laughs> oh, Naomi Harris, Naomi Harris. Very I good. only remember that because she. Gets Did you really see Rampage? Big? She gets really big in, in Rampage. No, 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 no. In in Pirates of Caribbean, you, I do like not a... remember the third. I remember the first Pirates movie, and that's it. Oh, that's which is, I fun. think, the only one I, I should remember. One, um, next would have been Our Kind of Traitor. Mandela Long Walk to Freedom. Our Kind of Traitor is a real stinker. Uh, really, that's a real. I thought you were about to say a really good film, no, but a you... real stinker of a really? film. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then Skyfall. Then Moonlight. Gotcha. The last one. You got to guess the actor based on their filmography. The other guys. Uh, you know, Mark Wahlberg, Will Ferrell. Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider. Yeah. So it's not... Uh, too Fast, uh, Too Furious. Too, too, uh, great. So that's, that's not... Uh, the Women. The Women. The Women. Oh, is that... You you know me too well. You know I haven't seen I any of these films. <laughs> Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans. Oh, um, uh, Eva Mendes. Yes, Eva, Eva Mendes. Mendes. Eva, Eva. I don't know which one. It Eva, is. because it's an E, and it's. I remember because she's in Ghost Rider with Nick Cage, who's in Bad Lieutenant. With yep. her. Uh, yeah. Next would have been Training Day, The Place Beyond the Pines, and then Hitch. What is she? She doesn't really make films anymore. I don't see her in much, to be honest. She's but I think she's really good. She's, she's great she's in Place to Beyond the Pines. I think are they together? I think they, yeah, are, they are. But together, I can't but I confirm. Yeah, I, I don't know. But yeah, oh, okay. did they get together on Place Beyond the Pines or a different I, film? One would assume that is where they met. I God, believe that's so hot. I love that for them. Yeah, well, anyway. Ryan Gosling with like the bleach blonde hair and like the yeah, tears the, the dropping tears. from his eyes. You just well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, <laughs> keep in your pants. Um, okay, well, I mean. I got that. I think you can make it. I think harder. I need to make it. It's, you know, it is actually hard to go through and find actors who have been in not like like, lot, like 10 films yeah. that you either know of or have or haven't seen. James, you need to go back to Lincoln and look at the cast. Yeah, the cast is of Lincoln. Work away from you there. So when I was doing this, I, I was like, okay, I need to think of a bunch of actors. You know, when you try and think of one actor, I'm like, I can't think of a single actor. Yeah, so yeah. I like, I just Google just to get the, my, my juices flowing. Actors into Google. And like, I just typed in actors and it came up with like, you know, all across the top of Google, you to guess who it would just, no, so here's the thing. It had like what clearly Google thinks are the top actors. It, like, what was clearly in order. Yeah. And I'm curious, I've chosen the top 10 male actors and the top 10 female actors that Google just was like, these are the biggest actors by okay. Google. Can you guess based on Google, what is the number one actor? And what are the rest of the top 10? So when you type in actor- When you just type in what actors are the into Google, okay. what is number one and what are the rest of the 10? Um, is it not obvious? Num uh, it's fairly obvious, but also like you could, you could skip a through. Leo is, is four. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt is uh, seven. Michael Fassbender. Just not in it. Uh, uh, okay. Tom Hiddleston. No, no, no. Tom Hills is not in it. Who just or who do you Tom think Hanks. is number one? Tom Hanks is number one. Okay. Tom Hanks is number one. Who do you think is number two? Is it not someone you think? No, it's a justified. Very justified. He's kind of like, you know who's a good actor? If like basic Robert De Niro. Chat? No. Denzel Washington. Oh yeah. All right. Yeah. Shall I read them out to you now? So it's Tom Hanks is number one. Denzel Washington, Samuel L. Jackson, Leonardo DiCaprio, Will Smith, huh? Robert Downey Jr., right. Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, Tom Cruise at number nine, which I feel oh, like, yeah. I don't know. Oh, and then number 10, Harrison Ford. Okay. I mean, there were many more, but I yeah, just thought names. interesting top okay, 10. Okay. okay, so now we're on to women. Who do you think is the number one female actor according to Google? Jennifer Lawrence. She is three. Emma Stone. Not on this list. Hmm. This is like you'll you'll kick yourself when you get it. Is it is this person top due to other 
things that are happening in the world? No. Okay. Purely for their acting accolades. Is this person... Can I ask questions like this? Yeah, sure. Is this person over the age of 40? Yes. Is this person over the age of 50? I think... So. Yes. Yeah, cool. Sorry. So yes. It's not Sa- is Sally Field? No, not don't on this know, list. I don't know why that came... Um, okay. Meryl Streep. Yes. Okay. She is yes. the number one. Yeah. Um, and then you had Scarlett Johansson at number two. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence, three. Kate Winslet, Sandra Bullock, Audrey Hepburn, okay. Nicole Kidman, Posthumous. okay, yeah, <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer, which I think uh, yeah. Julia Roberts. Re- no, sorry, it wasn't a reflection on Michelle Pfeiffer's no, uh, caliber like actress. Her residence of the moment. Yeah. And I think about Google algorithms. Then Julia Roberts. Then Reese Witherspoon. Again, also like uh, I can see Reese in there a bit, but okay, but all right. Well, there you go. I just thought that was kind of an interesting a nice bonus to the bonus. To, yeah, I nice. saw it and I was like, hmm, hmm, and that's all. If you've enjoyed this episode of Pop Kitchen, you can look out for them on our other channels. James, we do for the content. Spiel. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, you can follow us on I- Instagram and TikTok. Please give this video uh, a like and subscribe. It really does make a huge difference. Hit the notification bell. We post a new episode of this show every single Wednesday. Yes, so like, just, I'm going to explain that as well in case people, they, they understand, but yeah. it's like, our episode that comes out every Wednesday is like yeah, our do main a, episode. Do an it's Content like strategy. Ep- this, this is going to be episode. What the are we? Number this episode twenty eight. This is episode twenty eight. Okay, so we release that. But James and I also talk about a lot of other things as well. And you know, we don't want to take up too much by of the time, time in one slot. Sh- by the time we've got here, we've recorded more stuff that wasn't in this episode. Yeah. Mind blown. And what we often do, if you're you watching this, if, okay, if you're watching this on YouTube. We often release our extra content as individual clips. If you're listening yes. to this on an audio platform, we often gather together all our extra content and it, we call it extra, extra content. And we and release it's not it. extra because it's worse. No. We release it later in the week. So it's almost like an A track and a B track, you know, like you get on music and an old vinyl record. Okay, so it's like this, exactly. is the, this is the main episode. This is the A side. Yeah. The B side comes later. This is the single that's on the radio, but yeah. like actually your favorite song is like track seven. That exactly. It, it, it's actually Which, much deeper because you wanted to hear about what George thought of the Northman. I'm sh- sure people did. And that is why I thought I mentioned it in case you're missing something that you thought you might like. So that is the end of this episode. See you next week. Bye.